is that I think there was, a, there was an enormously influential point of view, which I associate with Bohr, okay, which is not on board with this von Neumann view, which is not on board with any sort of realistic attitude towards what's going on of the kind which would result in your feeling pressure to answer questions like, I wonder exactly where this boundary is, okay? I wonder exactly where to draw the line between those circumstances in which the Schrodinger equation applies and those circumstances in which something like the collapse postulate applies. Von Neumann is already somebody who feels the weight of that question, okay? But I think Bohr, uh, who I see as way, way more influential throughout most of the 20th century than von Neumann was in this respect, um, um, is thinking that even formulating the question that way um, betrays a kind of naivete about what the aspirations of the scientific project can possibly be. Okay. I don't think Bohr saw it the way von Neumann saw it at all. I mean, let me just to show that I can quote scripture with the best of them um, um, here. Here's a quote from Bohr. Ah, the Church of Satan. <laughs> right. No, no, no. I didn't say what kind of scripture. Right. Um, here is the next to last paragraph. And I take it, I always took it the most important one in Bohr's response in 1935 to the famous EPR paper challenging the completeness of quantum mechanics. Um, I, I think the next to last paragraph, the one I'm going to read, is much more important than the last one. The last one wanders off into issues about general relativity, um, um, which aren't really relevant here. Here's what I take to be the climat climactic paragraph in, in Bohr's paper. Bohr says, this necessity of discriminating in each experimental arrangement that is, this is one of the things that Bell cautioned us never to do. This necessity of discriminating in each experimental arrangement between those parts of the physical system considered which are to be treated as measuring instruments and those which constitute the objects under investigation may indeed be said to form a principal distinction between classical and quantum mechanical description of physical phenomena. It's true that the place within each measuring procedure where this discrimination is made is in both cases largely a matter of convenience. While, however, in classical physics, the distinction between object and measuring agencies does not entail any difference in the character of the description of the phenomena concerned, its fundamental importance in quantum theory, as we've seen, has its root in the in, in this is a big phrase with Bohr, the indispensable use of classical concepts in the interpretation of all proper measurements, even though the classical theories do not suffice in accounting for the new types of regularities with which we're concerned in atomic physics. And here's the money quote. In accordance with this situation, there can be no question of any unambiguous interpretation of the symbols of quantum mechanics other than that embodied in the well-known rules which allow to predict the results to be obtained by a given experimental arrangement described in a totally classical way. This is a very explicit and very dramatic disavowal of the whole realist scientific project, it seems to me. This was Bohr's reaction to the measurement problem. And this is something that I think gets at, um, gets at what was at stake in discussions of the measurement problem. Somebody like von Neumann as monstrous as his theory is, as Tim rightly says, is already in the realist camp, okay? He's trying to say not, he's not trying to confine himself to claims about how measurements come out. 
He's trying to say something about what's actually going on in the world. Well, sometimes the wave function changes this way, and sometimes the wave function changes that way. Bohr thinks that even going remotely that far is a huge mistake, okay? Bohr thinks that that this kind of this even the even the monstrous Frankensteinish kind of realism that von Neumann is presenting us with is already is is a, already represents a failure to learn the real lesson of the so-called measurement problem, which is that you ought not to be trying to to solve what Tim called the reality problem at all. Okay, that's the wrong place to start. The right place to start is the place where Heisenberg seemed to be starting in his discussion with Einstein. Okay, and that's what I think is at stake. Okay, that's why I think, as it were, if you construe the reality problem as the problem of saying clearly what is the reality, that's ignoring the even bigger debate which is occurring in the background of this, which I associate with the phrase the measurement problem, which is whether that's a problem that physics, you know, can or should aspire to solve in the first place. Okay, so that's my sermon. Let me just make a, a, a couple comments here, which will also take us back maybe where Robinson wanted to begin, back in history a bit. Um, well, first of all, I think Bohr says a bunch of different things in a bunch of different places that can't be put together into a single coherent story, right? So you can, you know, the devil quotes scripture, or you can quote the devil's scripture for whatever you want. <laughs> probably find, find him saying it somewhere. Um, um, the there's a curious thing about the particular paper you mentioned, which was Bohr's response to the EPR paper, because the title of the EPR paper is Quantum Mechanical Description of Reality Complete. And on the attitude you're suggesting, the answer should have been just like one sentence. No, of course not. We were never looking for such a thing, right? Who would think it was complete, right? Who would think that you could read off all the physical facts about a system from this because that wasn't our, but that's not Bohr's response. I mean, he's going to a great deal of effort to give a different response. Let me now go back even a little more in time. Um, there was a big deal about this collapse of the wave function from the beginning. It was the very thing that bugged Einstein from the beginning. Right. And this again is not to do with what we would normally call a measurement. So Einstein said, all right, is, and this is, you know, what, like the beginning of the Schrodinger cat setup. Take a single radioactive atom of uranium, stick it in the middle of a big spherical detector, um, and wait. Now that that turns out not to be representable quantum mechanically, really as a as a measurement of anything. But you know what'll happen if you wait long enough? A spot will appear somewhere on that sphere. Um, if you do it many times, the spots will be evenly distributed over the sphere. They'll a- arrive at different times, and so on. And what the Schrodinger evolution is doing all before the spot forms is, as it were, the wave function, which begins very concentrated at the center of the sphere, is, as it were, slowly leaking out in a spherically symmetric manner, um, just constantly at a certain rate, right? And, and, And that, notice, that doesn't break the spherical symmetry at all. Um, and from that wave function, you then can calculate a probability at any given time that a spot will appear here or here or here at that time. Um, now Einstein then said, but wait, that can't be a complete description of what's going on. I mean, I mean, it's not that something's slowly leaking out of this thing. I mean, Einstein thought was, look, it's a radioactive atom. At some point, an alpha particle or whatever just breaks free. It's bouncing around inside somehow and and it jiggles its way free and it shoots off in some direction and and then it hits the sphere <laughs> um but a moment before it hit the sphere it was right near the sphere right there heading out in that direction right it was gonna you know einstein you know has this picture obviously that's what's going on um his his objection to the collapse of the wave function is involves the two things he always complained about quantum theory. One was that 
first of all, where that spot occurs is, as it were, fundamentally probabilistic. It's not predetermined by anything, right? It's a violation of Leibniz's principle of sufficient reason. That is, that, that quantum theory was a fundamentally probabilistic theory about nature, right? God plays dice with the universe. Um, and Bohr never responded, no, of course God doesn't play dice with the universe. That's just our ignorance about what's going to happen. Bohr's response was, who is Einstein to tell God what to do? Right. So, you know, the, certainly the orthodox theory embraced the chanciness as a fundamental feature of nature itself. And the second thing about the collapse of the wave function was that when the spot appears here, the part on the sphere way on the other side, which just a moment ago, there was a chance the spot would occur over there because this thing is leaking out in all directions. That chance immediately and globally disappears, instantaneously, gone, right? That the collapse of the wave function is not merely probabilistic, but instantaneous and global, that spooky action at a distance, right? Einstein thought that just obviously violates relativity, you can't make sense of that. Really, what this wave function is, is just an epistemic description of what we know. It's not a description of what there is. And that's what he wanted them all to agree to. And then say, yeah, let's now look, let's try and come up with theories that tell us what there is and not just what we know. And of course, we know Bohr and Eisenberg and so on push back against Einstein. I mean, if, if, if they were on the same age, they should have agreed and said, yes, of course, that's fine. Um, I mean, maybe they could have said why either why do we care for a more complete theory or I just don't think physics can achieve a more complete theory. Or Einstein would have come back and said, well, why not? I mean, give it a shot, guys, you know. <laughs>